Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Now, welcome back to another Real Conversation where it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Kyle Bass, who needs no introduction. It's going to be a great conversation back and forth where we're actually going to let Kyle we'll let you talk, uh, which is important uh, to let you articulate all the, all the work that you've done uh, over not only you know, the course of the last couple of years, but over the course of your career on this topic. I think a lot of people uh, are certainly by looking at the queue of questions we already have. And by the way, if you have questions, pop them in the queue. I'll try to get to them uh, after Kyle and I go back and forth. But Kyle, thanks for taking the time to do this. Of course, Keith. Um, so first um, on China, I want to, you know, I don't think you can bucket these two topics uh, into two separate buckets. They're, they're obviously in the same bucket, but want to talk about the growth outlook that you have uh, both the cyclical and the, the secular growth outlook in China, and also the, the leverage and, and, and how that plays uh, such a big part in, in your analysis. But maybe just start with uh, your current update on the cyclical side of the Chinese problem as you see it. Sure. Well, I, I think as everybody's seen, you've seen uh, a pretty big credit impulse uh, in the first quarter in China from the perspective of, uh, of let's just say, credit expansion. The interesting thing that they, the stock markets have taken that uh, and, and run with it. But I think it's, it's very important to understand where that credit went. And that credit's not making it to the small, medium-sized businesses in China. Uh, what, you, what you've seen, China's enormous expansion has come from their, their basically their infrastructure spending, their, their local government financing vehicles or the vehicles that have been financing infrastructure and the SOEs that are, some of them are, are wildly unprofitable. And so what, what you're seeing happen at the beginning of every year, you, you notice in January the credit impulse always looks uh, enormous, and that has a lot to do with the fact that a lot of the loans in that system are one-year loans. And uh, we have a saying here at Heyman that uh, a rolling loan gathers no loss. <laughs> and as you as you move forward, and you just uh, basically term out the interest that's not paid in cash and grow grow the credit balance, uh, what it looks like is a is a in a, a large credit impulse. And again, I know we'll get into this a little later in the talk, but it's really important to understand where China is in the time continuum of its, of its global macro economy. And, and what we believe is if you just take a 50,000 foot view of, of China Inc., uh, China's running a augmented fiscal deficit, i.e. the government number plus the local government financing number of roughly 10% of GDP. So they're running a fiscal deficit of minus 10. They're running a they will run a current account deficit from now on. And I, we can, we'll, you and I will get into that in, in this talk. Uh, so you have a dual deficit nation with a closed capital account. But it's not like a dual deficit nation like the U.S. with a free capital account and also a hegemonic position. You, ha you, you can't run a dual deficit economy with a closed capital account and stimulate the way you've stimulated in the past when you had a positive current account. So anyway, that's where I get to, to China. You're going to see... Uh, you're going to see you're going to see it turned down. So another thing, Keith, you and I both know, Chinese numbers you have to take with a grain of salt and, and maybe a bucket of salt. But <laughs> I think I think if you just look to their trading partners, let's 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 look to their trading partners a bit. South Korea, South Korea's exports are down eight uh, percent year over year in March. Germany's manufacturing PMI forty four point one. That was the worst PMI in Germany since two thousand and twelve. Japan's t Tankan March survey sentiment of large manufacturers in Japan was at a six-year low. So China can tell us that they're growing and they're really stimulating, but their their trading partners, their largest trading partners, are telling you that things just aren't very good. And that's something that you at Hedge Eye are so good at, at noticing. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to watch uh, the transmission mechanism of that data across Southeast Asian equity markets as well. Uh, you've had many days, as you know, where the Shanghai Composite Index is almost. Uh, marked up into the close. In fact, it probably is. And you have the, you know, you have the commensurate non-markups. In fact, many of these uh, Southeast Eastern Asian markets have been down. Um, just to show uh, everyone what you're talking about in terms of Kyle, you have s slide number four. If you show Kyle's uh, slide on the economic downturn, and this is really the question I have about this, Kyle, is just kind of. First of all, you you nailed it. The economic momentum has turned. The next slide, if you guys can go to that, um, where we're sh where Kyle's chart uh, has Chinese economic momentum across. Uh, across buckets, property, consumer goods, Kyle, transportation, energy, and infrastructure. Uh, I guess you know, some people would say that that, okay, great call, Kyle, and, and okay, it's, it's all priced in. One PMI number and we're off to the races. And by the way, that number is subject to be made up as well. Not saying that they are or they're not. I'm just saying that most of these lines, all these lines, in fact, the scariest one is the one most people don't talk about, 
which is consumer goods or consumption, is downward dog big time. Um, you know, what, yeah. wh why is it not bottoming? I mean, I, I guess is the first question. Yeah, I guess it, it goes back to the point that, you know, can it bottom in the near term? You and I both know, Keith, that in these, in these cyclical moves higher and lower, uh, you're going to have uh, aberrations in the data. You're actually going to have improvements in the data, yep. uh, especially, especially the way that you and Hedge Eye look at things with regard to quarter over quarter and month over month. You can, if the number's bad enough the quarter or month before, the next one's actually going to be incrementally better, <laughs> uh, you know, 80 or 90 percent of the time, depending, right? So, again, this is just uh, the law, law of macroeconomics. But I think if you're looking towards the trend and the trend and the hopes of the globe are that China's just going to go to the gas pedal once again, like they did in 2008, to move the, the global economy out of uh, the global financial crisis. And, you know, while we apl I applaud them for what they did in the past, when you look at where they are today, back then they were running a huge current account surplus, yep. i.e. their the reserve balance was growing, their, cre their, their credit markets, uh, let's say their bank credit and credit in general, uh, wasn't anywhere near the levels that it is today. And, um, and so they had a lot of room to go to the gas pedal. What I'm telling you now uh, is if you're running a secular current account deficit coupled with a fiscal deficit that's the largest in the world, bar none, uh, in gross terms, um, that it's really difficult to, uh, let's just say, expand credit, use your FX reserve balance to acquire the iron ore, the food, the oil, and everything that, that it takes for you to buy that you don't already have as a resource domestically, uh, you can't do that because you're already down to the, to the minimum levels of, of working capital or FX reserves that you need just to operate your economy. Yeah, that, and that part of the FX, there's so many different components to this, and again, uh, I, that's why I wanted to have this conversation with you, because I want to get into the not-so-subtleties of the components of, of, of your argument at this case. A lot of people don't even know what the difference is between running a current, uh, current account surplus and a deficit and, and what it means to try to finance these things with dollars. So uh, I want to get into that, but first I want to nail down uh, the, the cyclical versus the secular one more time. You mentioned 2008. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of institutional clients, uh, many of which you're friends with, Kyle, will come back and forth with me. And I'll actually say it's actually a lot like 2016 as well. Um, so just to, again, I don't agree with that, but I know where it's coming from. Guys, if you queue um, slide uh, 93 in the current uh, macro deck, you can see, um, and you've seen this, Kyle, where we show secondary industries in China, heavy equipment, partly empty cities, et cetera. This is where the Chinese effectively stimulate on the infrastructure side in, in particular. You can see that, that line, to Kyle's point, went to almost 0% growth coming out of 08. They stimulated like never before. But, but then it was different. And again, he's going to go through you know, that one more time so that you hear it clearly. Uh, 2016, Kyle, is when they stimulated and the whole world was at the bottom of a sine curve, whereas here, we're coming off the top of a sine curve in terms of global growth and U.S. growth. So um, what do you think about that? And if you do think that, that, that this has just been a long-term avoidance of a secular decline, can they do it a third time, really? Can they get that, that, in this case, this red line that we're looking at, can they get it to go up one more time for long enough for you to believe the numbers? I'm talking about like three to six months from now, not just one month. Right. So. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I don't know if I can tell you they, can, they can't do it for three or four or five months, but I can tell you that, it, that by the end of this year, uh, no one will believe the Chinese numbers. So it's <laughs> difficult for me to predict the next two or three months, right. but I can no, tell exactly. you the difference between today and 2016. Is 2016, China was running a massive current account surplus, right? Uh, after, after dipping down in 2014, at the end of 2014, remember, I think, again, th when you think about a current account surplus, it's basically a transfer of wealth from one nation to another. Um, a positive current account means there's a positive wealth transfer coming into the nation, i.e. foreign currency uh, in, all in all of its different denominations. And a current account deficit means they're, they're spending more than they have coming in um, from an operating perspective, right? And then there's, then there's uh, uh, the, the, basically uh, cash transfers behind that, uh, investment flows that, that don't count towards the current account. But what's important to look at China's uh, current account is, right, they're desperately short crude oil. They're desperately short travel services, i.e., when the Chinese travel abroad, they don't spend RMB because nobody accepts monopoly money. 
right? <laughs> so they have to spend dollars, euros, yen, or pounds, mostly dollars, whenever they travel around the world. The 400 million people that have been brought out of poverty, they're desperately short iron ore. They're desperately short food. And all of those things, they actually have to pay, let's just say dollars for, but I really mean FX. They actually have to pay that. And so that when you ask why it's not the same as 2016, their current account is now below zero on a secular basis. Their fiscal deficit is expanding, and they're running out of dollars. Mm-hmm. And back then, well, back then, they were still growing their dollar balance. So they could expand credit domestically, grow GDP domestically, and then think about dollars of working capital was growing so they could just go spend it to do so. Now, they can't engage in a massive construction boom because they don't have the dollars to buy the iron ore and the galvanized steel and everything else they have to buy that they don't have sourced domestically. Yeah, that's a, the, the critical point. Again, when, when things have blown up, at least recently, and I think that this is uh, the most relevant reason as to why your case should start to make sense in the next six to 12 months more so than, like again, in the next six weeks or six days, who the heck knows? No one knows. Uh, but in the next six to 12 months, you know, this, these chickens come home to roost and, it, and it's you know, quintessentially different this time for them, but it's the same that we saw last year in Turkey. You know, pick it, pick any country that's running twin deficits and is yeah. seeing economic growth slow. You can run twin deficits when you have economic you know, acceleration, but in my world, like and in most people that are measuring and mapping this in rate of change terms, when you say an economic growth slowdown on top of a lot of leverage and twin deficits, there's, there's not, a, not a country in modern times that hasn't blown up. And I, and I, and I guess you know, some people would turn around and say, okay, uh, I think I know what you're talking about, but it sounds good. Okay, that sounds like a bad thing. Maybe, maybe we should be exposed on the, on the bear side to that. But none of these countries, Kyle, have had closed capital accounts. So what, what, what's, exactly how, do, right. how do people understand the difference between that and say, you know, like, a, like I mentioned, like Turkey or Argent, Argentina, pick anyone that's had a twin deficit. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to think about currency boards, right? You think about, again, I think the way that Argentina used to work and the way that Hong Kong works today. And then you, it, it, that's, that's kind of a, a, a freely trading open capital account where, uh, again, if you run out of dollars, the world sees it right away. In China's case, how many times have you heard, but they're China, they can do whatever they want, <laughs> right? And, and, yeah. and, and I, 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 I've, I've heard it, I've heard it a million times, but that's actually true. And I, that's why I think, you know, you have to separate the world of China into two worlds. One is their domestic world, where they control the printing press, and they're the best in the world at printing money uh, domestically. Uh, the price level, right, the police, and mm-hmm. they control the narrative. They control all four of those things. And I actually believe that China can do whatever they want domestically to, uh, let's say, paper over or uh, fix any, any, any uh, economic ills that are, that are derived by over-levering RMB, okay? Mm-hmm. But when you look at China, China, unfortunately, has to interact with the rest of the world. And, and I say, unfortunately, for them, from their perspective, because I think they could keep this going um, a, a, a very long time if they didn't rely on the rest of the world's resources, which, of course, what you've seen China's, um, let's say, sovereign um, acquisitions of resources has been nonstop uh, from, from the CCP's perspective. They are desperately short all of these resources. Therefore, they have to constantly import them. And... And, you know, uh, if, you, if you turn to the slide that I sent you about on crude oil, I think it's really important. I think it's slide two. Yep. Um, this, is, this is the case that we try to build. If you look at the dotted line, uh, that uses the right y-axis, and, and, and that's, the, that's the sheer tonnage. They measure their crude oil imports in tons. And, and uh, the solid line is actually the net dollar amount they're spending on crude oil uh, annually. So if you see... Uh, the the uh, dotted line looks like a perfect y equals mx plus b slope, right? Um, and and basically, I'll, I'll make a couple of points here. You look at at uh, at the end of 2014. Remember when crude oil dropped from $100 a barrel to roughly $35 a barrel? You saw the dollar price of crude imports that or the do, the sheer number of dollars China was spending on crude dropped from call it 240 billion dollars a year down to a little over a hundred billion dollars a year now the most recent print even though crude is still what sixty dollars a barrel uh, down still down from a hundred um, 
they, they're, the most recent print is they're, they're importing 462 million tons of crude a year. And now they're spending more today than they've ever spent in, in sheer dollars in spending for crude oil imports. Well, what's important about this is at the end of 2014, they were importing about 300 million tons. And now they're importing 462 million tons. In four short years, their imports of crude have gone up 50%. <laughs> so this is a secular, like, does, that, does the dotted line look cyclical or secular to you? <laughs> Right. So this is this is China's problem. This is this is the you can't have your cake and eat it too forever problem. They have to spend dollars and they're running out of them. Now, what the way that they're making up this deficit, as you've seen, is they pressured MSCI to allow Chinese stocks into the index. That was vitally important to keeping China alive uh, because they were running out of dollars. And now all of the global index managers uh, blindly are going to invest in Chinese equities. Lovely. Uh, and the other thing that they do, I mean, you, actually, your next chart, if you can explain that in terms of actually funding uh, this capital account and how they're using uh, the bond market to do so, you know, maybe walk th people through this. Sure. So, uh, you know, this is from uh, the Bank of International Settlements through Q3 of last year. And if you notice, really, it didn't, they didn't really start borrowing in earnest uh, until 2014 when their current account was headed towards zero before, again, before crude oil collapsed. Uh, and now you see they borrowed a little over a trillion dollars. They borrowed $250 billion alone last year. <laughs> in, and now this is borrowing in dollars. So, you know, you went back and mentioned Turkey and Argentina and uh, these other twin deficit countries. China, I know it's, it's, it is comparing an apple to an orange, but they're starting to look like a traditional EM, right? Mm -hmm. They're running twin, they're going to run twin deficits and they're borrowing in dollars. That's, that's the formula for the EM blow up, especially if you have a closed capital account. So what the Chinese are doing is they're actively borrowing dollars in both in the banking sector, so China's banks, uh, and uh, corps globally. Now, th this, is, this is, again, a very important point to make, point, point, important point to make. When, uh, when, let's just say Tencent does a $2 billion bond issue in Hong Kong uh, or in Europe, they do a $2 billion euro issue, that money is actually fungible and usable by the federal government of China, i.e., uh, it's technically 10 cents. They technically uh, have their own claim to those assets, but that money gets wired into the PBOC, and China Inc. can use that money for working capital, yep. i.e., uh, trade. Right. So, what, this is this is a, a case in point. When you look at all of these points together, when you look at their problem with crude, their problem with iron ore, their problem with food, their problems with travel, which uh, is another slide. If you don't mind, we'll we'll go to that one. Yep, that's the uh, first slide. Yeah. So when you look at, at, the, at the Chinese, you know, uh, moving 400 million people moving from abject poverty to the middle class and the middle class to the upper class and the upper class to the elite, what are the first thing the Chinese do? Well, the first two things. They send every single one of their kids to school in the West. Uh, so there, you know, there are 370,000 Chinese students in the United States and there are 11,000 U.S. students in China. I mean, that, that tells you the whole story. Um, but they have to pay dollars for tuition. None of the U.S. schools yet take RMB as payment. But, but then also the Chinese travel. You know, you and I, as you travel the globe and I travel the globe, you see more, a much larger, uh, uh, let's say, group of Chinese people traveling in all of the different vacation destinations of the world. So when you look at this chart, this is quarterly in billions of U.S. dollars. The most recent quarter uh, was a negative 82 billion. Again, I ask you, you know, when you look at the when you look at the balance of payments, services balance and outbound tourism, these two lines, uh, what do you see? Do you see a cyclical problem or do you see a secular problem? Yeah, secular is a really important word for again. And we have a lot of people that are uh, again, it's it's not because it's allergy season, but we have a lot of people out there that are indeed macro, macro tourists. I think you're one of the first guys to co have coined that, if not the first. Yeah. Uh, but again, I mean, it, it, you, you have cyclical problems again, shorter term, intermediate term, quarterly, and you have secular, long term, not going away like demographic problems, for example, yeah. uh, you know, around the world. And again, if I, I guess your point here is. One, you're either you're either borrowing dollars or you're really short dollars, and you need dollars to travel abroad and do anything you want to do. Um, but but that's the real problem that the that the Trump administration or any administration could actually take advantage of is that you know what they have at this point in terms of their actual dollar problem. 
That's that is exactly correct. But let's let's just come to the realization that in in looking at the various verticals inside the Trump administration, again, whether you're talking about the U.S. trade rep in Lighthizer or you're talking about uh, the National Security Council or the various intelligence agencies or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, any of those things, those people um, have only recently come to the realization of what the Chinese banking system, credit system, and let's just say global macro outlook is um, so that they can integrate that into our trade negotiation. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a, and this brings on the, the leverage problem. Anytime you want to negotiate with somebody and you have this kind of negotiating leverage, they have to have your currency and a lot more of it. You know, maybe contextualize uh, before we go into some of the, the other not so subtle issues that you've called out, and I think you've called out on your own, um, but on the leverage side, you know, you've got 48 trillion. Can you give us, can, can you contextualize that within both Chinese history and where the U.S. is? Yeah, so going into the U.S. financial crisis, the, the, this was key. The U.S. banking system had about a trillion dollars of equity uh, in the system, and we had 17 trillion on balance sheet in uh, banking assets, and we had, um, you call it another five or six trillion in, uh, in, in off balance sheet if you looked at Fannie, or Fannie and Freddie in, in the non-banks, right? Uh, so during our crisis, so when you think about it, we were a little bit over one to one in, uh, in banking assets. Uh, we're about 1.3 times banking assets to GDP in total. Mm -hmm. um, and we lost about $800 billion in the financial crisis. So through common and preferred equity injections throughout the crisis, we essentially recapitalized our entire banking system. When you look at China today, China today is north of, and I'm, again, we use the current spot rate of the Chinese currency to the U.S. dollar. Um, they have a little over $50 trillion worth of RMB of banking assets on an economy of 13 trillion, on a bank equity position of about 2.6 trillion. So if you look at some of the reports of what the non-performing loans are in China, you know, even the World Bank has said, or sorry, not the World Bank, the IMF recently said uh, about a year ago that they believe the actual non-performing loan number in China is a little north of 7%. Well, you go 7% of 50, and you get to three and a half trillion in non-forming loans, and that's what they're kind of, uh, that's what the IMF conservatively estimates. And then what will loss given default be, right? It'll be, it'll be at least 80 cents on the dollar for some, all the crap they've been lending to. Um, so they're gonna wipe out more than all of their equity in their banking system. And by the way, it's probably much worse than that. So when you think about leverage in the system, they have, they have put together the most reckless financial experiment in world history in gross and not in net terms because you know you got uh, back back during the financial crisis you had iceland ireland and greece all had 10 times their gdp in their banking system right mm -hmm. so um the, and and those fell like dominoes very quickly but on a on a gross basis the, again so, sorry 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 about that um uh, when you think about um the size of, of the credit impulse within their system or credit balances in their system, uh, they, they have an economy, uh, ours, the U.S. economy is roughly 20 trillion, theirs is roughly 13. Their banking system is north of 50 and ours is 20. Yeah, so just, just think about, I know they're smart over there, but they've only been at this capital markets thing for about 20 years at most. We've been at it for over 100 and look, look at the predicament the U.S. got ourselves into and, 2007. Well, and some people make that point too to me, Kyle. I mean, as you know, I'm like door to door on this on the road a lot, you know, meeting with a lot of people who have a lot of different opinions. And, and most importantly, those people run a lot of money. So those opinions are constantly, you know, being imputed into market positions. And a lot of people say, well, they're so smart, you don't get it. And by the way, they're going to absolutely make sure that it works. Um, but what you're saying is, yeah, okay, you got you know, debt to GDP ratios that, that have been higher in other countries, but never in world history have we had this, the world's second about to become, or they'd like to think to become, the number one GDP country in the world that's running effectively on your numbers. That's 50 divided by 13, you're four times levered. And that, that has never happened in, in size or scope, or most importantly, 
at the, at the worst time when you're running a tw you know, twin deficits with growth slowing. Yep. That's bad. I mean, I don't know how you could, I guess that's, I, mean, I guess people kind of hope, they want to hope uh, that this is what it is. Just to be clear on the 50 trillion, because people will, will, that'll definitely echo in their ears if it's not already. That's including bank assets. Can you go through all the different, um, you know, that's, that's on the Chinese government numbers themselves, including shadow banking assets? That's, inclu that's including shadow banking. So uh, that's, that's on balance sheet banks and shadow banking. And uh, I can actually say, I, I only sent you a few slides to keep things um, from get, keep us from getting lost in the weeds, but I can right. I can send you that in a slide if you'd like. That. No, but that, they got a whole bunch of things: trust beneficiary rights, trust loans, all that stuff's going to be in that number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. TBRs, WMPs, wealth management products, everything that they've got moves into into that number. And and look again back to shadow banking. You know, if you remember uh, in the going into the U.S. crisis. The things that broke first were the were the SIVs and all these different acronyms, right? The spe uh, all of the all of the shadow banking, um, highly levered assets were were the were the first things to break in the U.S. And at, at the peak of the U.S.'s uh, position of, of leverage in, in 07 or late 06, uh, shadow banking assets or structured assets, uh, leverage structured assets were only two percent of the U.S. banking system in China. It's well over 10% of the system. So it's five times as bad there as it was here at our worst. <laughs> well, I, this is where you know, p some people, uh, I guess Chanos would have been criticized for this, but a lot of people would say, wow, look at, look at what all these things created. They created these property bubbles. Look at these empty cities. I have videos. It, it, it actually happened. You know, everybody could see that it happened. I guess what a lot of people missed in 16 was that that actual stimulus that was pro-cyclical uh, or rather counter-cyclical off the global cycle low had such a huge growth um, impulse. But again, that is yesterday's news looking back two years. Now you have all the vacancies up, you have all these, um, you know, like I said, all these, all these bank assets that have ballooned. Wages are weak, exports have been tattooed. You know, any behavioral thing that started to happen, I guess you and I were talking briefly on this, but I'd love to get your, you know, how you think about you know, anything that's happening around the margins, happening in Hong Kong currently, uh, behaviorally, that might just submit that all this is actually as bad as it sounds. Yeah, I mean, I think it all, first of all, this all reverts back to your question, can they do it again? Yeah. Can, they, can they just expand credit, um, open the spigots, uh, roll, roll all bad loans and initiate new ones and generate this, uh, this uh, economic impulse? Mm -hmm. And the stock, the stock market in China is telling you absolutely, and they've, they have front run it. Uh, but I think, the, I think you must pay attention to the actual numbers as they come out, and more importantly, of their trading partners than China. Yep. Um, but, but when you look at, at what's going on in these trade negotiations, in theory, in the trade negotiations, we're talking about uh, whether or not the U.S. is going to impose 10% uh, or 20% tariffs, or 10 or 25 on $500 billion worth of, of Chinese exports. We're talking about 50 to 120 billion dollars on an economy over there of 13 trillion and over here of 20. <laughs> like, in this should be a nothing event. Like, whether or not we impose tariffs, it actually shouldn't matter. But why it matters so much is those are dollars, yeah. and they are running out of dollars. And 100 billion dollars coming out of a of a balance of roughly two trillion um, is. Uh, you know, is is actually really meaningful to them, and so that's why that's why that's important. As we get into these trade negotiations, two of the things that have absolutely not been settled from what we're hearing of these negotiations are measurability and enforceability. And the Chinese uh, haven't haven't moved an inch on agreeing to having uh, these measures measured or or in unilaterally enforceable by the U.S. And those are two of the main, uh, let's just say, main negotiating points of the U.S. position. And one of the things I think that's complicating things that, that uh, very few people have paid attention to is that the Chinese um, have actually put together a proposal to allow Hong Kong to start extraditing people China wants to put on trial. And I mean extraditing in an extrajudicial manner, i.e. without moving through the rule of law based system that, that Hong Kong maintains and maintains its own sovereignty through. And China's pushing hard here. And, and what's, I know this sounds arcane and, and on off the subject, 
But it's really important to note that the U.S. Uh, engaged in an act with Hong Kong in 1992 called the United States Hong Kong Policy Act, in which we, we, we recognize Hong Kong as its own sovereign. Uh, and as long as they maintain a rule of law and as long as they maintain uh, their democratic system and their autonomy is how it's written. You've now seen in the last couple of years China's heavy hand moving its way into Hong Kong. And whatever uh, spark uh, that Hong Kong once had as a democratic uh, region uh, that was a, a, a region uh, that was integrated uh, or let's say partially integrated with China is now gone. And I think that if you saw what's happened in the last week where Nancy Pelosi invited a delegation of uh, people from Hong Kong over and just basically said, this isn't going to work for the United States. We're not going to allow the 85,000 Americans that live in Hong Kong, uh, we're not going to leave them open to extrajudicial grabbings from the street of Hong Kong. And I think it's important to pay attention to things like that. And it's something that, let's say, the British have just started. Uh, to talk about, in fact, Keith, I don't know if you've seen it today, there's an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal uh, about this. Mm. Uh, the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and their business allies are speaking against this proposal. And uh, just last Friday, the UK Foreign, Foreign Affairs Committee rep issued a report on China, Hong Kong, and they called it one country, one and a half systems. Wow. And, um, you know, the U.S. and the British are really starting to push back here. And again, this sounds let's just say innocuous and small and from a macro perspective, not that important, but it's hyper important to the region if all of a sudden the UK and the US start treating Hong Kong as China, because today Hong Kong or China exports a lot of things through re-exports through Hong Kong, and they raise a lot of money, dollars through Hong Kong. And um, China itself is threatening the relationship that currently uh, 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 is tariff-free with the United States because we treat them as their own sovereign. That's one of the things that people need to start focusing on that no one's paying attention to. Well, I mean, you've, you've, and you've been all over this. I mean, for the people who haven't, haven't seen it or read it, uh, Kyle wrote a fantastic uh, op-ed on this, I think it was in Bloomberg, um, that was saying, look, the U.S. has an opportunity here. Don't take the easy way out. And, and, and if, if, if we let them, because we need to have this, the optics of a stock market in the U.S. that can't go down as the U.S. slows, you know, there could be a moment here that, that is really dangerous, I guess, is what you're, you're submitting for the West that's being made, not, you know, not ironically, for political reasons here in the U.S. as well. That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. I mean, where we stand today in our negotiations with China, uh, we're, we actually have the strongest case we've ever had. And Trump shouldn't wake up that day and say, you know what, I'm going to do a deal. Uh, because when you, when you look at the various constituents of the U.S., negotiating position, uh, I think everybody uh, is aligned, focused, and they understand what the U.S. needs in a reset with our relationship with our frenemy, China. And I think that, uh, I think, I hope that our president just doesn't, uh, um, let's just say, usurp uh, uh, or overreach everyone on his staff and just do a deal uh, for deal's sake, because right now there are 89 million members of the Communist Party that President Xi has said, the U.S. will blink at the end of these negotiations and we will get a deal done. Imagine if we just move forward with the 20 percent tariffs and let a few weeks go by. Imagine what kind of negotiating position we'll be in then. <laughs> and I mean, to be clear, it's not like you're painting every single poss possible um I mean, there are so many different possibilities with Trump, obviously. But I mean, yeah, yeah, look, a reduction of tariffs would be good. You know, you look at any component of of a, of a Chinese deal that includes adjusting foreign ownership. I mean, there are things that could be good here. You're just saying that the longer term you know, issues that the Chinese have fully loaded with espionage and everything else and stealing our stuff is just what the, you know, the, the full deal should be focused on. Yeah, I think. What's important uh, to, is to, you know, this is not ideological for me. I think you just, you just hit it on the, on the nose where you said, you know, if, when you drive into the U.S. Commerce Department and you go through security and you look up on the building or right where you're driving through the arch, it's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And it says, trade with foreign nations needs to be fair and equitable. Mm -hmm. And that's all that matters. So, you know, uh, if we're going to have free trade, let's have free trade. Let's have unabated free trade between two countries. We can't 
protect various industries and disallow investment and have government subsidies, both overt and covert subsidies. You know, the relationship with China is anything but fair and equitable, and we need to reset the relationship. That, that is what I'm a proponent of. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on that. I'm just going to hit on the U.S. here quickly uh, before we take some questions for you, Kyle. That this this Q and A is 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 oversupplied, I guess, with a lot of a lot of different questions. I will try my best to get to it. Uh, again, just pop your questions in the queue. But let's just uh, circle the ducks on that, Kyle, and you know, bring it to the U.S. We've mentioned it enough times. You know, just your 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 brief outlook on the U.S. here and how you think it plays out within the context of the Chinese and global slowdown that you think will continue on a trending basis? Yeah, so I, you know, what, what we did with the tax cuts uh, is we, the U.S. stimulated at full employment, right? So we have emergency levels of rates still, uh, or crisis levels of, US, of rates in the U.S. Uh, we had basically full employment uh, as is defined by the Fed, and we, we engaged in a monster tax cut. And so when we look at the the fiscal impulse delivered by that tax cut. Um, last year, we believe that number was about $250 billion uh, of, of stimulus going into the U.S. economy. This year, we believe it's going to be about $400 billion, mostly front-loaded. Uh, and next year, it's going to be $150 billion, so 2020. So when you think about the way this works, and again, what Hedgeye is really good at is thinking about the deltas. So it's not, it's not 250, 400, 150, everything's better. It's from last year to this year, the delta is, a, is right a plus 150 billion. Mm -hmm. And from this year to next year, it's a minus 250. And so the way that we see it is the U.S. economy is doing great. The rest of the world seems to be slowing down a little bit more than everybody thinks it is, whether you look at Germany or whether you look at Southeast Asia or, you know, you can look to all these economies that you look at and you see, you know what, things are slowing down. Uh, and some countries are already entering, entering recession. Um, and that's, that's a head scratcher for many. But when you look at the U.S., uh, we believe that the impulse or fiscal impulse will wear off in the back half of 2019. And um, I'll give you an anecdote. We just had uh, one of uh, Pelosi's good friends at our house in San Francisco, and I was talking very much about a U.S. infrastructure plan or something else we could stimulate with, because I think absent a new stimulus, the U.S. will be in a recession by Q1 or Q2 of 2020. And I, I think that even overlaps with your view uh, of when we could be in a, a shallow recession, Keith. Um, but uh, I said, you know, are we going to get some sort of public-private infrastructure uh, stimulus going into 2020? And, and uh, this woman told me, she said, you know, Pelosi thinks Trump has taken this economy hostage, and she's ready to let him shoot it. Uh, God. So, so I can't imagine the Democrats allowing the Republicans to stimulate going into 2020. So, and again, trying, just trying to be, a, I'm trying to be apolitical and, and, and call the spade the spade, to the extent that the, uh, the, the left wins the election in 2020, I can tell you this. One thing is an absolute fact. It will not be good for capital. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you truncate tax reform, you know, truncate will be the big word and uh, not Trump anymore. I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, slide 27, guys, if you can show it. If, if Kyle's right on this, and, and I, don't have, uh, I don't have as, as much conviction until I get to see more information, but all you need to know within the context of everything Kyle said is that the base effects or the comps, the tax reform comps, are going to only get tougher as we go into the next three quarters. So again, all things held equal, you're going to have to have more stimulus, more cowbell, and accelerating economic data beyond anything that anybody you know, can see currently, certainly us, in the data for the U.S. economy not to decelerate. Okay, so. Um, you know, tax reform did happen. It gave you this massive uh, economic acceleration that's unprecedented in nine quarters in a row on a year-over-year -year basis in the U.S. while the rest of the world was slowing. Um, so again, I guess that's your point too, right, Colin? I mean, you can't have, uh, you, you think that as if on a trending basis, if China has these, these bounces but ends up in a bad place six to 12 months from now, that altogether with the U.S. slowdown is just, just bad altogether. Yeah, and again, it's not the end of the world. We're not talking about a global financial crisis where you worry about where your money's safe. It just means that, God forbid, we might see a shallow recession. Yep. 
Well, I mean, we're not going to see a shallow recession in profits. We're going to see a sharp you know, recession in profits. Uh, if the yeah. you know, yeah. it, so that, That's the other part of it, too. I mean, people, you know this, obviously, Kyle, but a lot of people just totally, um, if only because they're permeable marketers of the, of, of the, of the one-liner that if we don't have a recession, we're fine. I mean, you can have no recession uh, and a profit recession where you can lose 30, 40, 60 percent of your capital. And that's, that's the point. Um, if capital stops to flow and we end up with this shortage of dollars from the Chinese side and we have a shortage of profits on the U.S. side, you know, I don't know what the moment is. I don't wake up like uh, some kind of miniature version of Nostradamus. And by the way, he wasn't very good either um, to tell you what that moment is. But people, they all, I guess you probably get asked this all the time too, which is like people just need that security blanket, Kyle, of when does it all matter? When does it all matter? When the reality is that nobody really knows when that moment's going to be. No, uh, that, that, that's a good point. And, you know, look, in, in our world, um, you know, being wrong for one year, you know, you're on probation and being wrong for two and, and you're a complete idiot and, and they should, uh, you know, just take their capital somewhere else. And we're talking about pretty long time continuums for many of these things. It's yeah. One, one thing is certain is that, uh, again, China is so over levered and now running cyclic or secular current account deficits and, and fiscal deficits that, uh, you know, I believe it's uninvestable. And yeah. for those for those capital allocators that are that are allocating capital there, you know, uh, I guess you have to get over a number of things. You have to get over the fact that there's no rule of law, uh, that they they have a terrible human rights record and it's worsening by the minute, um, and a closed capital account. I guess I guess if you can get over those three things, you should invest your money in China. <laughs> um, and and I know I know it's the fear of missing out, and I, I realize it's index overperformance or underperformance, but. In the end, there are going to be a lot of institutional investors that should be re re relieved of their duties um, in the positions they occupy because they were chasing this uh, El Dorado, uh, w w ignoring some of the key aspects of, of uh, proper investing. Well, there's so, there's so much about this that is, is, is effectively just looking backwards at the last two to three months of charts, as you know, Kyle. I mean, so many people are under duress in our business. I'm talking about asset managers, money managers, hedge fund managers. Performance has been horrendous by and large for a long period of time. And now they're, yeah. after selling low in December, they're forced to chase high here in March and April with the Chinese of all places being their number one catalyst. I see this in every meeting. It's hard to refute what you can't see. Um, and I, I, you know, frankly, I don't even know I don't even know what to say back to people until I see more information, you know, economic information and or market signals. And it is uh, you know, certainly you know, uh, what it is. I mean, the Chinese breakout in the stock market or the inability of it even to have more than two down days in a row uh, is a bit of a problem if you're a bear right now. Yeah. I, the good news, Keith, is I think these are the most exciting times to be alive because I think the, the potential outcomes, uh, there's such a range of potential outcomes yeah. that... Uh, I think I can tell you this, 12, but in, from today until, uh, let's say, next April 1st, uh, we're not going to have a sideways market uh, with little or no action. We're going to see <laughs> a lot of ups and downs between now and then, and, and we could see some, some major ones. So you, you think? I think it's time to be on a heightened sense of alert. I think that's a great point. I mean, if, and, and it's so hard for people, and isn't it so sad that I have to make this statement, and you're echoing the same sentiment, a year ago today, I mean, just pick today. I mean, a year ago today was the biggest net long position in the history of the euro versus the dollar. Uh, the whole world was lined up for a quote, quote unquote, globally synchronized recovery. Meanwhile, all the data in China, Europe, emerging markets was slowing, readily apparent to anybody who's measuring and mapping the data uh, coherently and with the process. And now a year later, you know, everybody's on the other side of it saying it's fine. We didn't call any of that, but we know how we're going to come out of it. It's, it's, it's amazing if only you're looking back a year, never mind three, five, and ten. In your case, you're looking at the Chinese, you know, history all the way back. So uh, I think you're absolutely right on that, and I shouldn't have been so dour. You know, it's, there, there are plenty of opportunities. It's always a great time to be alive. Um, I'm going to ask some questions here in the queue, if you don't mind, because I have so many sure. of them. Um, you know, what, a lot of them you have to do with, like, okay, I get it. You're not going to nail the timing. Uh, I don't expect you to. But what are the cracks and the signals that you're looking at day-to-day, uh, week-to-week, month-over-month? Is, is there anything in particular that you really you know, think matters more than anything else? Oof, that's, a, that's a great question. I mean, we like, we like, I think, everyone else in this world, we track 
hundreds of different indicators. Yeah. And, and, and against the, uh, you know, when we look at the Chinese indicators, it's, uh, we just hold our nose when we look at those. And we try to back into China's numbers by looking at all their trading partners' uh, numbers, uh, being those in Europe and those in Southeast Asia. Uh, so we look at all of those as a collective and say, just to try to forecast the direction of where things are, are headed. And, you know, even though the world has seen, you know, and, and for those of you that are on the call, I think many of you who know uh, what we do, you know, we're not short and haven't been short any Chinese equities. Um, we just focus on uh, rates and currencies, uh, mostly when we think about global macro. We do own, we do things in the U.S., but we don't do things internationally per se in a large way in equities. But uh, while the equity markets have gone uh, both down very quickly and up very quickly in China, I think the economic activity shows a little bit of a bounce in the first quarter, but not a bounce commensurate with the size of their uh, credit impulse. So I think just looking at all of those things together is something that we do at all times. And, you know, there, there, there are indicators that, that people should follow uh, from every macroeconomic perspective and just take China's with a grain of salt. Yeah, well, a grain of salt, you know, ironically enough, I mean, if you're fractally oriented, I mean, it's a sand pile theory. So every day there's grains of sand falling on top of the sand pile. And we as humans, you know, don't know which one will destabilize the pile. But again, it's really important to do all your work and have a multi-factor, multi-duration model. Again, multiple factors, multiple data points, like Kyle just said. The, the, the days of the old wall where you just have somebody come up, you know, or come down from a pond high, and tell you what date and how it's going to look. I mean, that, that, that's just complete bullshit. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I had to say that. Hong Kong dollars, getting a lot of questions on that. What do you think about that, Kyle? Um, that's a good question. I, I think that um, if, if you're just honest about um, currency boards, currency pegs, and you study the history of these things, you know, this one's been in place for 35 years. There was a really good reason for that to be in place 35 years ago, and, and we can get into those. But the <laughs> bottom line is economies change, trade relationships change, the macro economy changes when 15 years ago Hong Kong was the largest port in the world. Today it's roughly number six or seven. But 15 years ago China was only 6% of the world's exports, uh, or, or let's just say throughput in 20-foot equivalent units. Today's China, China is 65% of port throughput. So I, if, if you take a long, hard look at what is Hong Kong's end game, what's their future? Oh, and by the way, their banking system is 900% of their GDP. <laughs> they are reaching, they are right up there with Iceland, Ireland, and Greece. And they're, they're, they just had the biggest real estate boom in the history of their country because of why. The U.S., they have to import U.S. monetary policy uh, being pegged to our dollar, i.e. their overnight rates have to approximate ours or be very close. Um, and so in 2008, money became free because the U.S. took our rates to zero. So Hong Kong money became free. And at the same time, their largest trading partner went to the gas pedal, right, 2009, 2008 and 2009. Um, now you have an economy with the highest household leverage to GDP in the world, the most expensive real estate in the world, and the highest amount of banking assets GDP. Oh, and the two largest banks in Hong Kong are two bastardized versions of British financial institutions that are bankruptcy remote um, with no UK depositors. I mean, <laughs> Hong Kong is a place that I would not invest in uh, with my enemy's money. Uh, and yet, and yet it, it happens to be because because it's been 35 years of stability uh, and a financial hub for the region, people don't think twice about uh, investing in Hong Kong and Hong Kong dollars and Hong Kong assets. I would be running as fast as I could away from Hong Kong if I were you. That's crystal clear, right? Um, here's another good question. Uh, do you think China will have any success buying oil in renminbi and not be beholden to dollars given renminbi de denominated crude futures contracts and large central bank gold holdings as another possible payment method? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, Xi and his, and his cadre of, of Politburo members have, have made all of the trips necessary to see MBS, see <laughs> MBZ, uh, and they have, they have pled and begged for an RMB-based oil contract for the very reason I showed you in my chart. China is so desperately short oil 
that they would love to get someone to accept wampum in exchange for oil. And um, <laughs> so far, number one, the people in the Middle East don't trust the Chinese uh, leadership as far as they can throw them. Um, and I've met with a few of these people. Um, and sec secondarily, uh, while they do have a listing and China may push some volume through it to, make, to, again, develop an appearance that it might be happening, it will never happen because you can't spend RMB anywhere else in the world. And China, again, has, think about this, they claim to be the 15th, uh, or sorry, they claim to be the second largest economy in the world at 15% of global GDP. And yet if you look at SWIFT's cross-border currency settlement, they're less than 1% of all currency settlement in the world. So which one is it? Oof. Too many uh, thoughtful questions there, Chuck. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is out there, but we've had a, more than a couple of these, so I'm going to ask at least one of them. Uh, Kyle, China appears to be going for broke. Any commentary on this from a military kinetic standpoint? Or is that too drastic co to consider? It feels a, a lot like Germany grabbing as much as they could before the conflict of you know when. Yeah, let, let's just, let's as a world hope this never happens. Uh, exactly. But, you know, look, China has built a navy uh, that is larger than our navy in that hemisphere of the, of the world. Um, and, and it's approaching or, or it, will, it will exceed the U.S. Navy's uh, size in the next year or two if they keep spending at their current rate. And, you know, historically, those, the, the country that's had the largest blue water navy has always been the hegemonic power in the world. So, you know, we do have a Thucydides problem. Uh, with a rising power threatening a ruling power. We also have the kinetic co problems that you've seen in the South China Sea. Remember this, Keith. President Xi sat in the Rose Garden of the United States with President Obama at the White House, and he said, quote, unquote, we will not militarize our islands in the South China Sea. When Obama was saying, hey, why are you building 10,000-foot runways on coral reefs? And the next thing you know, they've got fighters, they've got bombers, they've got missile batteries and two-mile runways on coral reefs in the middle of nowhere. And so the Chinese have a long game. And, and one of the best books on the planet uh, help, that helped us understand their long game is Michael Pillsbury's The Hundred Year Marathon. Yeah, great book. And, um, you know, and Graham Allison's, you know, Destined for War. Um, and I've sat with Graham and, and Dr. Pillsbury and, you know, look, these are long time, both of them were, I guess they refer to them as panda huggers. They've been long time <laughs> uh, friends and, and, you know, Hal Pillsbury was part of the, the team that opened up the U.S. to China to counter the Russian influence back in the 70s with Nixon and Kissinger. And now he's one of the biggest China skeptics in the world. So mm -hmm. it's worth paying attention to Pillsbury. It's worth paying attention to Graham. But I think the net result of all of the questions of will we be in a kinetic conflict with China? I actually think it's inevitable, but I have no idea when. But I, I think, I don't know if you've seen, you know, what happens if a Chinese destroyer rams one of ours? You know, there have been four or five incidents where they've tried to ram one of our ships. And at the last minute, we turn, we turn to avoid the collision. I can tell you this, if one of their destroyers runs into ours and kills 30 of our servicemen. Oh, boy. It will be an immediate problem, and we will not we will not um, cower to the Chinese. I know I know that. Yeah, and, and, and so, in that book that you cited, I mean, Graham Allison's Destined for War. I mean, it, it goes through the whole point, which is it's never just one thing. It's a series of things and preconditions that build up to either an accident or even many times where the country didn't really voluntarily want to do what they ultimately did. Right. And, and exactly I think it, any, right. anybody who's studied history, you know, uh, Allison, I think he runs the history department at Harvard. Um, uh, us Yale guys won't hold anything against him on that. Uh, but again, it's a <laughs> great, great book. Uh, here's another question on this. Uh, these are some very good questions. Uh, we have institutional uh, subscribers on in as much as we have the broad audience on as well. Uh, here's, here's another question. And I've, uh, I don't know the answer to this either, uh, but I, I'd love to hear yours. If, if China is turning into an EM proxy, doesn't Trump have a lot of power in allowing the dollar just to appreciate against the RMB and use it as a weapon against the Chinese if these trade talks fail? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. And, you know, when, when Trump took over, and, and if you remember when, when he became president, um, you saw a lot of rhetoric coming out of uh, Peter Navarro and Trump himself and others, even Mnuchin, 
considering or, or the, basically considering the possibility of labeling China a currency manipulator. And um, the beauty in that statement, even though it's completely wrong, <laughs> um, the beauty is the Chinese can't defend the potential accusation, and here's why. China intervenes in their currency market almost daily to prop up the value of the RMB, not to, not to push it down, which is historically what a currency manipulator would do, right, to make their, their goods and services cheaper and, and help uh, increase the velocity of their economy. And so the beauty in, in, in Trump and Navarro and, and et al. considering labeling them a manipulator is China can't come out and say, what do you mean manipulate? We intervene daily to prop this whole bag of shit together. <laughs> and, and that's what they do. And so to the extent that China were to ever, if China were to open their capital account and let the Chinese invest abroad, travel abroad, and, and move money abroad, I mean, how many wealthy Chinese people do you know they can't wait to buy more real estate in China to invest more in China and send their kids to Chinese schools. Yeah, the, like, I don't know any, right? Yeah. So all of them would like to get their money out, and they just can't. And so if they were to really let that capital account open, I think the RMB would depreciate 50, 60 percent. Well, that, that's the only reason why the RMB hasn't depreciated 50, 60 percent. Literally, and you said this a couple times, I want to make sure people heard what you said, which is, you know, th they have all the attributes uh, developing of your run-of-the-mill EM crisis, other than, other than the closed capital account. You know, that's the, you know, that thing. I, I, and, and that's, you know, for me personally, why I've, I've, I've thought of that currency trade as being uh, one that I really can't understand relative to the easy ones to understand, which are all the EM trades that have worked since the beginning of time, which didn't have closed capital accounts. Um, is is right. there anything, you know, kind of a simple shortcut on that, Kyle, where you closed capital account can still mean Chinese yuan collapses and crashes? Oh, I mean, all I, all I think that means is, is I think w w what this means is it's just going to take a longer uh, to happen, yeah. but when it happens, right, the, the severity or the, the, the amount of the decline will be much larger. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting now. I mean, so, so if you go back to playing this, you know, now we got Kudlow, uh, for God's sakes, in there. Uh, apologies if you're buddies with him or, 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 or whatever. I mean, I, I, <laughs> no. I, I didn't think so. Um, but anyway, you know, you go former King Dollar guy, TV guy now is the chief guy advising the big guy. And, and the big guys, on one hand, saying, I want lower gas prices, but I want you to devalue the US dollar and cut by 50 basis points. And then on the other hand, has the Chinese by the throat with dollars and isn't willing to use that against them. So I mean, do you think Trump, I, I have no idea on the answer to this question, that's why I'm asking. Do you think he understands at least the moving parts that I, that I just outlined in 30 seconds on that? I think his, I think his key lieutenants do understand um, I'm pretty certain they do, actually. Uh, but the question is, you know, look, for, the, for, those, that, for those that just uh, don't know President Trump, he won't read anything that's longer than one page. He doesn't read any briefing books. Um, he, like in the first chapter of The Art of the Deal, he wakes up every day. Uh, he watches TV till 1030. He gets briefed on a couple of national security ideas. Um, he watches four hours of TV a day, and he makes decisions based upon uh, the flow of news that day. Wow. And so it's really difficult for me to answer a question saying, does Trump really understand where we are as a country in our negotiations with China? He knows a couple of things. China equals bad. China equals liars, cheats, and thieves. But he also knows that he's got to keep China somewhat close uh, for, for the U.S. economy's perspective, because Trump's only barometer of economic success is the U.S. stock market. Mm -hmm. And as long as he sees that doing okay, he's going to uh, do what he thinks he should do. If the U.S. stock market were to decline precipitously, he's not going to be tough on the Chinese. So the good news is um, it's not December 24th today, right? It's April, whatever day it is, 10th. Um, and the markets are, are up a lot, or sorry, it's April 8th. Uh, the markets are up a lot uh, from the beginning of the year. And Trump's feeling pretty good. And that leads me to believe that he may make the right decision in playing hardball with China. Now, that'd be interesting, because uh, that's definitely not what the market is long of. 
That is for darn sure. And the, the cue that I get every day, my inbox, Kyle, as you know, it's, it's fervent um, in terms of people's concerns. And it's, it's, it's usually about the upside in the market. Very few people are sending me questions even throughout our conversation here about the downside and when that could happen, how imminent it could be, if it is indeed the cycle stupid that would actually be the catalyst for it all, which it always or usually is. Um, people are asking about all the different permutations of how that could be postponed, how we could have more cowbell, how we could have more deals. Um, a lot of that these days. Uh, and on the cover of Barron's, which is you know, uh, certainly uh, not the eternal uh, zone of finding the forward-looking call a year from now, uh, has, uh, is the bull unstoppable? Uh, I, I'm holding that up for you, Kyle, just in case, because uh, I know you didn't read Barron's this weekend. But um, yeah, it's just, it's just a weird time you know, when it comes to all this. It, it, would it surprise you at all, maybe you know, final thoughts on this, would it surprise you at all that uh, if, if it were to come unglued rather quickly, you know, sometimes risks happen slowly then all at once, much like it did in, in October through uh, December, again, no matter from what point, at some point in the next year? Well, I mean, uh, truthfully, Keith, I didn't expect uh, October through you know, December to happen when we were looking at all of the economic indicators for the U.S., you know, we still, we still hadn't reached the peak of the efficacy of the, uh, of the tax cuts. Yeah. And so from, from, from my perspective, we didn't see that one coming. We missed it. Um, and, uh, you know, my goal was to, you know, think about hedging any of, any of the long exposure in our portfolio really in the back half of, of 2019, and that, that precipitous decline even caught us completely off guard, and, and I wish it didn't. But um, so to answer your question, I think things can un unravel very quickly, and especially if the market is long a trade deal and thinking that things are going to go back to the highs and that it's, it's a new bull market, and technically speaking, we're going to break to new highs. I just don't see that. And, I, you know, you see the Russell really lagging the S&P, uh, and the Dow, and you, you know that the transmission mechanisms in the U.S. are slowing down a bit, uh, and you're starting to see wage pressures like you've been commenting on. I, I just think we're going to see, in the, in the next three or four years, we're going to see lower real returns um, in the U.S., and I think that now is not the time to be putting a bunch of capital to work more broadly in the U.S. equity markets. And it wouldn't have been if this was a conversation that we had in uh, May of 2001. It wouldn't have been if this was May of 2008. And it is not yet May, but it's going to be May soon, Kyle, in uh, 2019. Yeah. So uh, those are big, big U.S. cycle tops, as you know, where you had the first sell-off, then everything was fine, you know, March through April yeah. of 2000. Uh, the S&P 500 actually marched from, if I recall correctly, from March to May of 2001 off an epic global gro or U.S. growth cycle peak, you know, the S&P went up 22% and every chart looked fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that to me, it, it, I guess it just wouldn't surprise me. I, I just, I guess, like, like you said, we're evaluated day to day, week to week, month to month, as we should be. And, and I think that this, uh, I hope that this conversation ages well because you've certainly enlightened a lot of people and I'm happy to, to, to have had the opportunity to listen uh, intently on, on how you th how you thought all this through from a longer term perspective because you're quite unique in that regard. Well, I appreciate the time, Keith, and I think, as I said earlier today on Twitter, I think you're one of the best third party columnists you see them analysts in the world, and uh, I hope I hope no one ever acquires you on the sell side. <laughs> I I am not going to the dark side anytime soon, Kyle. So we'll uh, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep chatting and thanks. Thanks again. Uh, we, we, we sincerely appreciate it. All right. You take care. All right, thanks. He's Kyle Bass. Right. You can find him on, on Twitter. He's got some great stuff. I mean, he's constantly updating you on the things that you will not find in old wall media. I'm Keith McCullough. You can find me somewhere, too.